is well known and respected in, uh, as an authority on Native Americans around the Apalachicola Basin. She has brought students to this area and they have conducted surveys along the Chipola and the Apalachicola River and around Lake Seminole. She has written a number of books and articles in addition to uh, the Archaeology for Dummies. She's written Gulf Coast Archaeology, the Southeastern United States and Mexico, and she's written specific works for the Florida Anthropologist. She's written a booklet entitled Apalachicola Valley Archaeology. So let's invite Dr. Nancy White here. We're so pleased to have you today. This part of the world is so rich archaeologically that uh, it makes me feel kind of bad that not everyone is aware of this. It might be like living in the shadows of the pyramids in Egypt and thinking, oh, that's just some big hill over there. And part of my mission is to talk to the public so that we can have everyone aware. Thank you. Now, the typical view of archaeology is, <clears throat> yes, Egypt and exciting things about the past. And I would like to re interpret that in local terms. Here's good old Howard Carter uncovering King Tut. And I want to emphasize what archaeology is about. It is about people. It's about people, not dinosaurs, not fossils. Um, and it's really not about the artifacts themselves, but about what they tell us about people. And yes, this is my book, Archaeology for Dummies. Actually, it's not very intimidating. It has all my lousy jokes from the classroom that I have to use to keep people awake. <clears throat> and, you know, like how does an archaeologist get a date and things like this. Um, but we have, oh yes. <laughs> we have to remember that it's about people, but unlike all the other social sciences, you know, psychology, political science, economics, sociology, okay, all those social sciences study living people. So the sociologists are going to go wild with all the census data when you fill out your form and send it in. Archaeology doesn't have that method. We don't need the people, just their stuff. Their stuff, all your stuff. And archaeology is simply about interpreting human behavior based on the material evidence. Let me see. Oh, all right, we'll go back. Um, and the interpretation of human behavior doesn't have to be from ancient times. So when you all leave, we can do the archaeology of this room, and we can learn some significant things. For example, you all had a fabulous breakfast brought to you by the friends of the caverns. And, but let's look at the remains of the breakfast. Well, we have some, some pig meat, shall we say? <laughs> but we don't have any pig bones in the garbage, do we? Now, what does that mean? That means those pigs, those hogs, were processed somewhere else. And the rem the, the, just the important parts were brought here. So already, that's much fancier than if we had to come in here and start butchering hogs early in the morning just to be on time and have the bacon smoked by 7 a.m. But you see what I'm getting at. This already tells us what an elite group of people we have here, because they don't have to butcher their own hogs to get their breakfast. And this is kind of what we do in the past. So this slide of mine shows the traditional research uh, that archaeologists do. We don't really want to have the artifacts as end products. We use them to interpret many things about the human past. So for example, <clears throat> past social systems, religious systems. Um, it, I should have put um, economic up there as well. The um, big questions about the past. How did food production start, for example? If you can wander around these rich forests and get all the turkeys and the deer and the 
fruits and berries and persimmons and, and nuts and stuff that you want without having to produce food yourself, why on earth are you going to settle down and start farming, which many of you in this county know better, is much more work than just collecting wild foods. Why do humans make that change? Why do systems of inequality come to be? where some people are more important than others, and some people get all the resources, and some people get the pig meat without having to go to the labor of butchering the hogs. <laughs> How about the origins of war? These are the things that archaeologists are looking for. The big questions these days involve the environment. How does human manipulation damage or sometimes help environments? How do environmental conditions affect human cultures? Disasters, hurricanes, global warming. Guess what, folks? We've had it before. I'll show you that in a second. Another thing archaeology does is to supplement history or sometimes even contradict history or teach us things about history that maybe we didn't want to know. Because, of course, history is biased, too. Who writes history? First of all, well, yes, men. Somebody always says that. But, <laughs> No, the people who write history are not only the winners, they're the people who know how to write. Yes. And so they're going to have their biases, right? And yes, often it has been white old guys, but I can't really say <laughs> anything bad um, in that sense, you know, having fallen in love with a lot of old white guys myself. But the point <laughs> is, <laughs> we want to look at history from the viewpoint of archaeology. So, for example, when the federal government decided to expand the visitor center at George Washington's home in Philadelphia, where the original White House was, and they just had, there's a law that says before you build on federal land, you've got to just check and see what might be there, and they started digging around the area where they were going to expand the visitor center, and guess what the archaeologists found? The tunnels where George Washington's slaves went into the back of the house so that the important visitors coming into the front of the house wouldn't notice that he had some slaves. Now, this was Philadelphia where slavery was not accepted. And we know he had nine slaves. You can read the history. The historians can even tell you the names of some of those nine slaves. But you don't read them up about them in the history books. So here the archaeologists are digging, digging, and here's all the public. Oh, we're visiting Philadelphia. We're coming to the visitor center. What are you all doing? They had to explain. There are kids who don't believe. George Washington, father of our country, he wouldn't have had slaves. Oh, yeah. The archaeology showed not only uh, the historic record that he did have slaves, but how this was kind of kept hidden. And, you know, George Washington was a wonderful guy for many reasons, but this is an important part of our history that we should know, too. So archaeology can enhance history, supplement history. Modern archaeology does a lot of other interesting stuff you may not have thought about. Archaeology is detective work. All those crime shows you see on TV, they all learned it from us. Look at all the stuff lying around and interpret what happened. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. We have a lot of cop workshops in Tampa where I have to help train law enforcement on how to interpret the material remains, how to dig carefully enough. Oh, yeah. the. Killer said he buried the body there. Oh, the deputies are just shoveling it out and throwing bones all over the place. No. <laughs> you want to see how is the body laid out? Is the bullet here? Is it here? You know. We do a lot of forensics. We learn about past technology, some of those cool uh, kinds of technologies that maybe we've forgotten that we might need again, like how to thatch a roof, how to make a cool home out of clay, how to find ethnic identities of lost groups. And I don't just mean Native Americans whose names we never knew. What about those whose history was not written? What about all the Africans who were brought in chains to this country? Nobody wrote about what they thought or felt, but the archaeology can tell us a little bit about their lives. Health issues, genetic issues. Oh, now I'm waiting for when we can do DNA for $9.99 a pop, and then we can get a lot of interesting um, data from uh, not only a human bones, but you know, what is the blood on the edge of this stone tool? What is this residue? This is a big, huge point. Oh, they must have been hunting a big, huge animal. Well, here's some bird blood on there, you know. <laughs> and the tools we get from other sciences that help us learn some of these things are fabulous. 
Heritage tourism is part of the subject of today's uh, interest. And of course, many of us may not have originally been born in Jackson County, but we've all come to love it. That's why you're here today. And just to learn about how people in the past lived on, enjoyed this land that we now enjoy, um, to bring this awareness of the environment and what it has to tell us about the past, the awareness of the law and of conservation, not to damage the archaeological resources, to preserve them, um, and the historical questions that we investigate. Consumer behavior is a topic of modern archaeology, studying not only garbage from home to home, but landfills. This archaeologist is sitting on the Fresh Kills landfill in New York City. Bill Ratchie does the famous studies. He named them garbology to sound fancy. To see what is it that people, do you think people throw away everything that they consume? Not necessarily. And he was told by the editor of National Geographic, I'm not going to do a, I'm not going to publish your article about the archaeology of modern garbage. You know, just find out what people buy, and that's what they throw away. And, and Bill told me, he told the editor of National Geographic, he pointed to his walls. He said, look at all those magazines in your bookcase. You haven't thrown them away. All the yellow National Geographics, you feel terrible when you throw those away, right? Um, archaeologists are studying how people use cell phones. The, the use of an artifact from the viewpoint of the artifact, and it is fascinating from country to country and gender to gender. Women have mi more missed calls than men. You already know that because you have to dig in your purse. And, uh, but the artifact record, in other words. So my work has been mostly in the Apalachicola Valley, the entire system. And in reminding you to fill out your census, Forms, for example, Dr. Clemens was reminding you that you're part of the Jackson County system, but you're also part of the larger federal system. And I, what I do now, we're here's the here's Lake Seminole right here, and we're sitting about over here in Mariana, and I study the entire valley. This is the aerial infrared photo where the healthy vegetation is green, you I mean is red. You can see the upper valley has more agricultural fields, and then we get down to the lower valley and the beautiful barrier islands. And these are the systems I've been studying for a long, long time. Zooarchaeology is the specialized study of the animal bones. So like I said, the zooarchaeologist would notice we don't have any pig bones here. Paleoethnobotany studies the ancient plant remains. Ethnographic analogy means we talk to descendants. We talk to people who live on the land now to learn how they get along. Ethnoarchaeology means we even live there watching how people live, how people hunt today or fish. Oral history, what do old timers have to tell me about how things used to be done, how, uh, where mounds used to be until they bulldoze them for road fill. <clears throat> and so I have been involved in all areas of this valley. I've surveyed around Lake Seminole, and don't forget the Chipola is over here. Um, and the um, valley and the lower Chattahoochee, of course, and uh, the um, upper valley, the river very nicely moves from upper to middle to lower, the barrier island chain like a beautiful pearl necklace. I have tried to integrate all the systems, and you know the environments differ as you go down river. The upper valley has higher banks, the middle valley with the beautiful bluffs where the Garden of Eden was. The, uh, and lots of wonderful back swamps. Um, lots of beautiful springs that just gush out of the ground. And you know how important fresh water was as a predictor of where humans would live. The lower valley, all low wetlands. We have done archaeological survey in many ways. In the lower valley here on the right, we have to go by boat a lot. Um, in the <clears throat> middle and upper valley, we often use a boat and check the riverbanks. We do surface collection of agricultural fields. Here's a very young Dale Cox working with me one summer. And we then, you know, um, try to put together the picture. Now, here's the entire 12 plus thousand years of prehistory and history. I see you all have your notebooks out. There will be a quiz in 10 minutes. But, um, 
and I hate showing a slide with a lot, a lot of words, but you see we go from the earliest people who may have come here earlier than 13,000 years. From the Osceola River, we have some good dates of over 12,000. So people have been in this valley a long, long time. And all the way up through the hunting gathering folks, then people started building mounds, then we have the late prehistoric chiefdoms, then the Spanish and other outsiders walk in. So I'm going to show you a tiny, tiny bit of this in the next couple minutes that we have left. How did people get here? Well, during the ice age, when an ice sheet up to a mile thick was sitting over the top of the continent, there was much lower sea level because all the water was taken up in the ice. So as you can see, Florida was much fatter here. And so all the earliest sites are going to be out here underwater today. We don't find many of them. Probably people could walk over this land bridge between Siberia and Alaska, but it would have been easier to take a boat down the coast. One hypothesis is that people came across the Atlantic. There's not much support for that, but who knows what we may find. Fascinating for this part of the world, all the very earliest, earliest cultural material in the Apalachicola Valley is not in the main river, but in the Chipola. All the way up into Alabama, Cowart's Creek, Marshall Creek, over the Alabama line. That is where the earliest stone tools have come from. And you know how beautiful the Chipola River is, the limestone banks. We get lots of um, nice fossils out of there showing the, and remember archaeologists don't study the fossils except as uh, an example of what the earliest inhabitants were dealing with. And I love this picture um, of the typical Ice Age landscape. Actually, it's totally wrong because you got elephants, mama elephant, daddy elephant, and baby. And of course, elephants travel in herds run by mama. Yeah, the oldest female runs the show in the elephant herd. I love it. Anyway. So, so you're a big old hairy mastodon or mammoth. You don't have any predators in the Ice Age, right? So these little figures over here running around behind the trees, are you going to worry about them? I don't think so. But they are clever. They are humans. And they're using these beautiful lance-shaped paleo points to harvest all these animals. And many of you hunt and fish, and you know those animals know that you're there. Right? And they change their behavior based on where you're trying to catch them. Not at first. When the first humans came into the New World, it was like a free grocery store. Because the animals weren't used to this predation, all this cleverness. And so we have, bless his soul, uh, Hub Chasen allowed me to photograph his beautiful points. Here are some we found on survey of the Chipola. And you can see little numbers, JA for Jackson County. This is a picture from the Museum of Gainesville showing that a lot of them were hafted onto a spear point, uh, onto a spear shaft with a bone or ivory foreshaft so that if it broke, you didn't lose your expensive stone point that you had to go all the way to the quarry for and so on. You just <laughs> lost your, your foreshaft. And the um, characteristic points uh, from this time period show that people probably were hunting all the big game animals that were in the Ice Age, mammoth, mastodon, giant bison with the horn span, it's extinct now, you know, of eight feet, giant armadillo, can you imagine? An armadillo this big, what that would do to your front lawn. Um, <laughs> and then it all ended. We don't know who killed the last mastodon in Jackson County. But why did this end? Well, because of global warming, folks. Because the Ice Age ended, but also, most scientists think now that human beings helped it along by killing off a lot of the big game. And when they had to readapt, all they knew was hunting and gathering and fishing, but with smaller species. So we have the archaic time period where we have different styles of spear points. 
And we have brought some artifacts to show from the different time periods I'm going to race through here in the next minute. Um, and I hope you'll all come up and take a look at them later. And if you have things to show me after the talk, I'll be glad to hang out for a few minutes, give you an idea. These are archaic period points for, uh, from, let's say, around 9,000 years is the oldest one, the beveled one, going through all the other stemmed and notched points down to maybe 3,000 years ago. Um, here are the cores they made them out of, and they loved being in Jackson County because it's like living right next door to Home Depot. You got all that, everything you want. You got the flowing springs and streams, and you got all this stone that you can get right off the outcrops. And soapstone came from North Georgia down the river that they carved bowls out of. The late archaic, about 3,000 years ago, they made these little teeny micro tools. And then somebody started making pottery, mixing clay with Spanish moss fibers, fiber-tempered pottery, late archaic, up to 4,000 years old. So ugly, only an archaeologist could love it. But why do we love pottery? Was this a revolution for people? Nah, they always had stone bowls and waterproof baskets and animal gut water jugs. But for the archaeologist, it's fabulous because it's something more that preserves. So here's a modern Indian lady in South America making her pottery today by the coil method. They didn't have the potter's wheel in the New World. And then we start getting the early woodland period uh, when we see pottery with a checkerboard pattern like this or with a crisscross pattern that indicates um, more uh, elaborate sorts of decoration. Um, and by the Middle Woodland, let's say around, around the time of Christ, maybe 2,000 years ago, people are starting to build mounds. Now this one's down in uh, Franklin County, but you can see this is a big mound, and I have a student standing on top here to give you the idea of scale, to bury the dead with special things. We can interpret some kinds of ceremony, some kinds of religious belief, but that's a lot harder to interpret than figuring out what people ate based on the animal and plant remains, isn't it? Um, I mentioned commerce and trade. Actually, I bought this slide in Ohio, so we're down here. But Gulf Coast shell was being traded up to Ohio. I mentioned that steatite uh, coming in from Georgia, mica from Georgia, shark's teeth, of course, we have here, um, copper, and even lead ores coming from the upper peninsula of Michigan all the way down to Florida, long distance trade, nothing new. New pottery for the burial mound people in the middle woodland with beautiful stamp designs from paddles using copper for ear decorations, uh, mica, here's some mica that was often cut out into beautiful shapes, figurines like this cone-headed guy here. We have been excavating selected sites along the river. Here's one in Liberty County. And you can see at the bottom of all this shell garbage that they left is a tiny little pit with garbage that we could get charcoal out of and find when people first got there and settled on this original sand of the riverbank. That one is dated to A.D. 420. And more of the beautiful Middle Woodland pottery from that time period. Um, sometimes the mica, a shiny stone, is cut into, this one is cut into an arrowhead shape, mica cutouts. Here's an archaeological remain type that is difficult to discuss in polite company sometimes, but it's a cool word if you ever want to use it at cocktail parties. Anybody know what a coprolite is? Fossilized feces, let's say. Fossilized feces. These are some from the site in Liberty County. It gives, it gives us an idea of what people ate. By the late woodland, around 1,000 years ago, uh, people were getting lots of shell from the Gulf to make ornaments. And they were still making this checkerboard pottery. It goes all through time. There's my list again. By the late woodland, uh, by the Mississippian period, 1,000 years ago, they're making these flat top platform mounds. This one's in Calhoun County. We do have a very famous 
site here with both burial and platform mound, Waddell's Mill Pond. I hope somebody takes care of that site is like uh, Rosetta Stone for Jackson County. It's packed full of scientific information. Um, here's another flat top mound in Liberty County. And why flat top? So they could put the ceremonial temples on top. And by this time, people were growing corn, little teeny ears. It came in from Mexico, but it was the way they made a living, making beautiful bowls. Here's the green stone from North Georgia made into axes and adzes. Um, this is a Jackson County site that I wrote on for my doctoral dissertation. Had beautiful pottery like this. Had uh, engraved pottery with some kind of interesting designs. Here's a feature we excavated with lime, chunks of limestone and big pieces of pottery, probably for making hominy, leaching that corn. And then it all changed again. This guy showed up in the New World. You've heard of him, Christopher Columbus. And look what he's doing. He's saying, Isabel and Ferdinand, look at the loot we brought. And this is loot too. People, slaves. In reality, the Indians were taller than the Spaniards, stronger, healthier. They said, sure, come on in, we'll share everything. The first Spaniard who got off the boat and coughed killed 90% of the native people. And the rest went quickly. Um, I won't go through the history, but we do historic archaeology. The mission period, here's a nice square nail, square spike from the Spanish period. Um, and we have found remnants of later Indians coming in from Georgia when all the original Florida natives were gone. By then, they were lower creeks. They were wearing clothes, British clothes. Look at this. She, she would have worn nothing but a little uh, uh, Spanish moss skirt 100 years earlier. Now she's in a floor-length dress because of the British influence. We do historic archaeology. Here's a shipwreck that we documented on uh, Little St. George Island and a Confederate um, camp, Confederate forts in the uh, lower reaches of the Chipola Cutoff Island. Here we are with, uh, this is Joe Kinnett right here, with um, metal detectors. So we do it from all, here's where we were in Virginia Cut, from all time periods. Um, and the last slide, the last message is public archaeology. Not only bringing it to the people, sharing what we found, but bringing the message that if you don't preserve it, it's gone. It's illegal to pick it up off state and federal land just like you would not go into Florida Cavern State Park and pick out all the endangered wildflowers for your own kitchen table. And if it's on private land, if it's um, somewhere you have permission to go and you're collecting artifacts, fabulous. You too can gain scientific information. But if you don't write down where you got it and when and how, scientifically useless. Most of the uh, comets and Heavenly bodies, astronomical things, some of you may know this or do this, are discovered by amateurs who have the time to go up and look in their big telescopes. It's the same thing with archaeology. I would have no career without the wonderful people in Jackson County and all the counties of the valley who have helped me learn where the sites are, and then I can then piece together the, the human story and share it back with, with everyone who's been so gracious. So I'll take any questions that you might have for a minute or two. And then if you have more after that, um, I would be happy to stay. I know I have to speak at a school a little later. But I'll be happy to help you out, look at your materials. And thank you very much. I think your question back here was first hand up. No, actually, um, lots of good work has been done there by FSU and UF, and I've got all I can handle in one river valley. <laughs> but I'm certainly familiar with it, and there were related native peoples there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When did color show up in pottery? Color? Oh, that's a neat archaeological question, because color is everywhere. And even your ancient Roman statue, you know, Venus de Milo is there in the white marble. Guess what? Wrong. They were all garishly painted. But the paint fades away. In pottery in the southeast, we had paint, red, black, buff colored, brown. We had some of that by a couple hundred years BC, at least. So at least 2,000 years worth. But they probably had so many other painted and colored things. 
and it's very hard to recover that because it fades. But I have a lot of pieces of red painted and black painted pottery. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what, you, what, what are you looking for there, or what would you expect? Well, actually, um, a gentleman who lives in the area invited me to come and see the archaeological site on his land, and I love it because it's, it's community-based science. Rather than me barging in and saying, well, I'm the big expert from wherever, um, I love to have people invite me. Yeah, and, and this is why I'm so thankful for the gracious hospitality I've had for a long time in this region. So, but yes, many people have invited me. And the problem is, Jackson County is probably got, if, if I could have Superman x-ray vision and see all the archaeological sites, there would probably be at least 100,000. All right? Even though we have maybe 500 recorded at the moment. Um, so I can't go everywhere, but I try to at least you know, respond when people invite me as well as I can. Yeah. Oh boy, I wish I knew. And you're talking about this design that does, by the way, these are some of our flint nappers making stone tools and some people showing off their collections and talking to local people here. But you're talking about this design, this kind of scroll. And I would love to know. And then there's a, a, a rectilinear version like this. Same thing, only sharp angles. I would love to know what that meant. Um, of course, I'm going to interpret it as, since pro probably, we're not sure, but probably women made the pots, I'm going to interpret it as, as a sign of girl power. But <laughs> who knows what it meant? It could have meant life-giving water in the waves. It could have meant, um, you know, sex. Who knows? These are some of the questions that we can't yet answer, and we probably never will answer. It could, but you know, let's look around this room. Now here's a gentleman in a plaid shirt, and you have wonderful uh, black and white pattern on your shirt. And here's another plaid shirt. Do those, oh, and here's a nice flowered sweater. Do those have meaning? Is that your clan plaid? Is it a symbol of anything? Or is it just a pretty design? And this is the problem we face, because we don't have these people to talk to. Uh, you mean the giant, extinct giant sloth, which is this big, huge, I love the museum in Daytona, has a stuffed one, don't they? That you, right when you go in the door, it's right there hanging over you. Um, and he took a picture of that. <laughs> um, I believe so. I believe so. I'm not a good enough paleontologist to know that. But if they were in Daytona, they certainly were here. I don't recall... Um, hearing that any fossils of that were identified, but I know they roamed all over the southeastern United States. Yeah. Two questions. Am I, am I going, wait, excuse me, am I going over my time here? You're okay. Somebody will come up with the vaudeville hook <laughs> when it's time to quit, okay? How long did it take to make these spear points for uh. a napper, and why are there so many here? Okay. I mean, we're all over the place. This is an, the, these are excellent questions. And it's easier to say, how, uh, why are there so many here? Like I said, there's so many outcrops of really good stone. That would be like saying, why are there so many screws and nuts dropped in the parking lot at Home Depot? Because people are all fixing their things, and, and they came there to get the parts, right? Well, it's the same thing here. There's so much available stone, a lot of quarry sites and a lot of good archaeology at the Cavern State Park, you know, there is a lot of flint outcropped in the limestone. Um, so you see that people came from, say, Gulf County, where there isn't as much stone, they'd come up here, but as you know, they're going to drop more stuff as they go along, too. Now, how long did it take to make a point? And most of them are not arrowheads, they're spear points. Bow and arrow didn't come in until maybe 1,500 years ago. Um, if you know what you're doing, and you have your rock from the quarry, and you have a hammer stone, and you start hitting, you can make a point in maybe 15 minutes if you're good at it. 
I try to demonstrate in my classes when I first start teaching how to nap flint or chip flint. I'm pretty bad at it, but I can't even sew without having blood spurting anywhere. Button on, somebody else sew my button, please, you know. Um, if you have the skill, you um, can make the desired tool in a short amount of time. And if you make a mistake, we hope you have a lot of raw material around. It's not like pottery. If you make a mistake, you can roll it all up again and make it beautiful the way you want it. But the uh, stone tool is a subtractive process, right? So the chips are going off and oops, well, I guess I'm not making a big point. Let's just turn it into a scraper and give it to grandma to use on the hides and then I'll start all over again with a new one. No, I didn't, but um, I did bring uh, posters, by the way, from the Florida Public Archaeology Network. There are also brochures, but the posters are put on every year by the Florida Anthropological Society at their Florida Archaeology Month events. And please take them, have them for your kids or your schools. Um, and the um, booklet, I did do the booklet in Apalachicola Valley Archaeology, and I brought a few. If you didn't get one, uh, give me your uh, name and address on a piece of paper and I'll mail you one. They're, we're getting low on them and I, I don't know if I can get it reprinted. Um, someday I'd like to have a little expanded book, but it takes a lot of time, so we'll see how soon I can you know, write that. But um, there are lots of articles on the area and maybe I'll just write up a bibliography for Jackson County and, and I'll be glad to send it out to whoever would be interested. Thank you very much.